So I suggest we wait a couple minutes uh, before the opening. I, I see that participants are joining. The numbers are increasing exponentially. <laughs> Okay, let us uh, let me start. Um, first of all, warm welcome uh, to all participants joining uh, joining us. I think from all parts of the world. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And it's really a pleasure to uh, open this uh, seminar uh, webinar jointly organized by FAO and UNEP uh, to discuss sustainability of agricultural plastics use. Uh, today we'll be, we will be speaking about benefits, about the trade-offs, but also about negative impacts of agricultural plastics on uh, soil health. Uh, as many of us know, uh, when plastic resins and plastic films uh, have been introduced in uh, 1960s, uh, plastic literally has become an integral part of agricultural production. Uh, to the point that uh, quite often you can hear the term plastic culture, which is specifically applied to uh, plastics use in the agri-food sector. Um, I'm very pleased to say that today we released um, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, a release a new report, Assessment of Agricultural Plastics and Their Sustainability, a Call for Action. I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues to uh, put link to the report um, in the chat. And I think as we are speaking today, uh, you will have an opportunity to, to download the report and uh, ask uh, maybe even more targeted questions. Um, in the report, we estimate that 2019 agricultural value chains uh, used 12.5 million tons of plastic. And this has to be complemented by 37.3 million tons of plastics used in uh, packaging, in food packaging, which is like many of you uh, know. So literally one third of this amount of agriculture of um, food packaging amount is used in agricultural production. Out of it, the majority of 10 million uh, tons uh, annually is used uh, by crop production and livestock sector. Um, 2.1 million tons are being used uh, in uh, fisheries and aquaculture, and 0.2 million tons are used in the forestry sector. Uh, plastics in agriculture has many benefits, and I think we will hear about this today, uh, which uh, supported increased yields. But also, uh, these benefits uh, came at costs, which we considered in this report quite significant. And again, uh, our panelists will be uh, speaking about um, those impacts of plastic pollution, uh, specifically in, um, in soils and other environments. Uh, to dive into these issues, uh, we have today with us uh, Eduardo Mansur. Uh, who is the director of the Office of Climate Change and Biodiversity and Environment at FAO, and Leticia Carvalho, who is the head of Marine um, and uh, Freshwater Branch in the Ecosystems Division of UNEP. Uh, they will be followed up by Richard Thompson, 
who is one of the lead authors of the report, uh, who will present the FAO report, and Christina Tigison from UNEP, uh, who will present a working paper produced by UNEP, Plastics and Agriculture, Sources and Impacts. Uh, then uh, uh, this uh, remarks will be followed by the panel discussion moderated jointly uh, by FIU and UNEP colleagues. And also we are very pleased uh, to have with us um, Sharifa Boyang, who is representing the Farmers Association. Uh, feel, uh, please feel free to drop any questions you will have in the chat. Uh, we will try to answer as, uh, as quickly as we can during, uh, during the uh, discussion today. Um, also, please prepare your questions for um, panel discussion. I would very much appreciate if you also could use chat to um, introduce yourself from where you come from. Uh, we would like to see uh, really to diversity of participants today. Um, and uh, with that, uh, uh, without further ado, uh, I leave the floor for Eduardo Mansur, uh, Director of Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment at FAO. The floor is yours, Eduardo. Thank you very much, Lev. Dear colleagues, a special thank you for my fellow citizen, Leticia, from UNEP that is joining us today here and the other colleagues from UNEP. This is a joint event put together by FAO and UNEP uh, to, to welcome you. And we are extremely happy to see the number of participants here at 350 plus colleagues from all over the world, from, from East and West. So good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are in the world. This, uh, Dialogue has been put together by FAO UNEP under the, the celebration of the World Soil Day, which as you know, is a UN observance on 5 December. So it's still in the spirit of the World Soil Day. I'm Eduard Mansour, I'm the director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment here at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I'm talking to you from Rome in Italy. And we are very excited with the launch today of this report assessment of agricultural plastics and their sustainability. We know that there is much visibility in the world about the impact of plastics in, ocean, in, in oceans, and not as much, uh, um, and uh, not, not much is known also <clears throat> about plastics impact on land. Hence, uh, the focus of the report that's been launched today and of this technical webinar is on the impact of plastics on soils and in the agri-food systems. From the point of view of the agricultural use of the food systems use, we are calling the event, if you see I, uh, in the banner <clears throat> and in the background of the colleagues, it says agricultural plastics, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because there are these three realities there. On the good, we know that plastic is an adaptable, low-cost material, it's frequently used in agriculture. It's only present in agriculture and food systems. It helps agriculture productivity. Mulch films, for instance, are used when cover soil for reducing weed growth, reducing the, the need for pesticides, the need for irrigation. In Europe, uh, where we live here, you, you, you always see plastic, for instance, at this time of the year, wrapping the hay to conserve the feed for animals. Plastic is widely used in, in greenhouse nets to protect, to boost plant growth, in, in, to extend crop seasons, to increase yields. So even, even plastic tree guards, we see in tree nurseries, right? Uh, protecting the seedlings against damage of animals. In food systems, plastics products are everywhere because they reduce food loss and waste. They help maintain the, the nutritional quality, conserve the elements. So throughout the value chain. And, uh, but let's, let's look at what happens if we, if we don't manage, if we don't look at it carefully. For instance, this year, the World Soil Day theme is on how soil salinization boosts soil productivity. And this campaign aims to, to, to raise awareness of the importance of maintaining healthy ecosystem by addressing growing challenge in soil management, including soil salinization, soil sodification. 
and farmers impacted by soil salinization have been turning to the use of plastic mulch uh, and drip irrigation to reduce impacts. But the problem, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, is not there. The problem is when it comes bad or it comes the ugly parts of the, the plastic used in agriculture and food systems. Single-use plastic is bad anywhere, and it's not different in the agricultural sectors because it can become a serious pollutant. Also, uh, the polymers and the addictives uh, uh, blended into plastics, they make their sort in the recycling more difficult. And when losing the environment, plastics can cause harm in several ways. And the disintegration in, uh, of plastics in micro and non nanoparticles, because you know of the durability of plastic in the environment, they can further affect the environment, they affect animal health, and they may affect human life. Um, the demand for agricultural plastics is increasing. I think Lev in the beginning explained to us the figures. They're impressive. They will continue to grow. So there is an urgent need for us to better monitor the quantities of plastic products that are used and that are leaked into the environment from agriculture and promote the circularity that is needed to, to reduce plastic waste, to reduce uh, 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 the pollution caused by plastic from agriculture and to promote prevention, uh, of course, the, the, and recycling. Here in the report, you are gonna read about the six R's approach. The refuse, redesign, reduce, reuse, recycle, and recover. By the end of the seminar, everyone should remember these six R's. Uh, the topic will also be discussed, uh, uh, not only here, this is a launching of the publication, but we are going to bring it next July to the committee uh, of agriculture, the FAO COA, uh, where our FAO member countries will look into the theme and will provide guidance to us on how to accelerate action. We, we have to, to, to increase our attention on this uh, aspect, and this is also possible here where we work at the FAO, because the strategic framework that we just designed for the period 2022-2031 has a special program, uh, we call it a priority program on bioeconomy for sustainable food and agriculture. We give particular emphasis in one of the sustainable development goals in that by, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, priority program. The, the sustainable development goal 12, indicator 12.4, responsible consumption and production, including uh, waste disposal. So the FAO report that we are presenting today is followed also by uh, from uh, colleagues from UNEP. We will discuss a new working paper on this topic. And uh, uh, it's so nice to have the UNEP colleagues here. It's a good example of a UN to UN collaboration. And I hope that uh, uh, we motivate with this uh, collaboration here that all of us engage and uh, work together on this because it's too big an issue. It cannot, no one can do it alone. Increasing collaboration in action uh, on these complex uh, uh, areas is crucial if we want to guarantee sustainability for the agriculture and food system. So the two publications, they, they partially fill the knowledge gap that exists in this area. They provide good ideas for action towards better management of plastics and uh, uh, in agriculture before and after they reach their end of life. Tackling agriculture plastics pollution will be an important step also in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration 2021-2030, which is, uh, has been launched by the, the UN General Assembly and uh, is co-led, uh, this decade is co-led co -led by FAO and the, 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 the UN Environment Program, the, the UNEP. So as a, a specialized agent uh, in FAO who leads the international efforts for food security and nutrition. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, we will continue playing our role to address agricultural plastics in a holistic way within this context of food security, nutrition, food safety, biodiversity, uh, conservation, and sustainable agriculture. We are looking very much forward to strengthening our collaboration with all of you to tackle plastic management and the risks of plastics and mic microplastics pollution in a comprehensive manner. So don't hesitate to contact us, to bring over your ideas, to join efforts, to mobilize the resource together for us to advance on this important work towards 
uh, sustainable agriculture and food systems. There will be no sustainable agriculture and food systems if we don't address the issue of agroplastics. Thank you very much. I return to you, Lev, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for so engaging, welcoming uh, remarks and uh, covering so much ground in, in, in this short period of time. Um, it's really my pleasure to give the floor now to Leticia Carvalho. And again, I remind Leticia, head of the Marine and Freshwater Branch, in the Ecosystems Division of the United Nations Environment Program. Leticia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lev, and uh, thank you, Eduardo. Great, greetings from Nairobi. And on behalf of UNAPA, I'm really happy. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, in this timely discussion about agricultural plastics and also as part of the celebration of the World Soil Day. Uh, indeed, I'm speaking from Nairobi, UNAPI, the sister agents of FAO, and also I'm a, a, a fellow Brazilian citizen uh, as Eduardo, uh, and I'm also quite engaged in my branch, Marine and Freshwater, uh, branch as well, quite engaged in the uh, marine litter and plastic pollution discussions along the life, cycle, the life cycle and circular economy. So as already mentioned by Eduardo, uh, plastics have become an increasingly ubiquitous material. We can find it in everywhere in our agri food chain is not an exception. Uh, you can see there, uh, plastics are there from greenhouses, mulch films and irrigation tubes also to seed coatings and pellets for the controlled release of fertilizers and also into packaging that delivers food from farm to table. So while agriculture plastics can provide this very important short-term benefits such as moisture and temperature control, improved efficiency of agrochemical and fertilizer use, there are also significant concerns regarding the potential the long-term, the potential long-term effects on soil and ecosystem health, and ultimately on human health, because a part of this microplastics can also uh, actually affect uh, human body and uh, human health as well. In addition uh, to the plastics that are used for specific purposes in agriculture, plastics can also find their way into agricultural lands, incidentally through various pathways. And for example, microplastics can become highly concentrated in wastewater sludge and biosolids and uh, which are in turn are applied to agriculture fields. So improving wastewater management to find suitable solutions to this problem is imperative. And as we continue to foster, to foster uh, safe reuse uh, of uh, wastewater. So as a result of these various sources, agriculture so soils have become significant sinks for microplastics. And the problem doesn't stop there. Uh, the flow of plastics from agriculture soils to other ecosystem, uh, ecosystems is also a matter of concern. And if you take a look into the wind, surface, runoff and erosion, all of these processes can transport micro and uh, macro plastics from agriculture fields to waterways, waterways and finally to the ocean and adversely impact uh, marine ecosystems, economies and communities. So then the source to sea approach for agricultural plastics is also extremely relevant. And this comprehensive report that uh, I'm super happy uh, and proud to be here for the launch today, FAO uh, is launching today. And the working paper developed jointly by UNAP and Greta and Dow shed an important light on the issue that has not received enough attention yet. And they highlight the need to fill knowledge gaps around agricultural plastics and provide recommendations for improved management, including through reduction and the development and use uh, of alternative materials and systems where possible, as well as uh, adequate disposal. So this working paper from UNAP and Greta and all focuses primarily, primarily on the sources and the impacts of plastics and, uh, in the agricultural soil. Uh, but also we are looking to develop uh, further joint papers as can, uh, as, as Eduardo mentioned, joint papers that can also express uh, the way the UN system is joined hands uh, in order to address uh, source to sea uh, agriculture plastic uh, pollution. And uh, finally, let me just to share with you as we are uh, looking ahead, waiting for uh, UNEA 5.2 to take place early next year, hopefully, uh, if COVID and the pandemic allows us uh, to move uh, according to the plan. And um, we are as well uh, witnessing uh, very closely 
uh, growing momentum driven by uh, member states, uh, international community, uh, industry, uh, all stakeholders uh, in the pursuit of a global agreement on marine litter and plastic pollution. And UNEP has been providing support to various uh, recent country driven initiatives and activities, including a ministerial conference on this topic that happened and it was organized by Ecuador, Germany, Ghana, Vietnam uh, in last uh, September. Uh, in Geneva, and uh, there it was a great opportunity also to verify and testimony uh, the momentum for and the, the great push uh, for the establishment of an intergovernmental inter negotiating committee uh, to develop a global agreement on this urgent topic uh, at UNEA 5.2. In the meanwhile, while we are uh, looking, working together in supporting governments in this journey. I think as Eduardo mentioned, UNEP and FAO are collaborating closely on fostering healthy ecosystems through the UN Decade on Oceans uh, Ecosystem Restoration. And let me don't uh, forget to mention the UN Decade on Ocean uh, Sustainable Development uh, as well. And these two decades actually representing a lot, uh, a great opportunity for all the international community to join hands. As the working paper discusses, uh, efforts to maintain healthy agricultural ecosystems should include innovative and in some cases, traditional solutions that can reduce the need for plastic materials in agriculture. We are looking for a nature positive food production systems uh, that can recognize the biodiversity underpins the delivery of all ecosystem services on which humanity depends. And we will look to uh, have this conversation with you today uh, in a very informative and enriching presentations and discussions. I really thank you. And as Eduardo mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to keep connected and uh, to find uh, opportunities to work together. So that's what we are looking for. Back to you, Lev. Elisa, thank you very much. Wonderful, again, wonderful words. And I think it's, it's a fantastic segue. I also wanted to mention that as all of us understand, it's still, it still remains to be an emerging area, not only of research, but also of practice and the policy. So I really encourage all our participants, please uh, share relevant links uh, to the topic. Please express your interest um, because we will be looking for collaborations. We will be increasing it. I mean, from both sides, from both organizations. So please feel free um to share it um, not only for us but for all participants but now just to uh test the temperature a little bit within the audience but also get some um good uh, get some interesting answers from you um, we would like um, to invite you to take part in the poll um and uh, i think i'm again asking my colleagues to to put questions uh on the screen um this poll uh includes only a single choice and i think all of you can see uh again thank you you're very active i uh, i think it's again the technology allows us to <laughs> to see the this in uh, in online so uh, let me see um, there are 379 participants today so let's wait a little bit Fantastic numbers are still increasing, but I think I already see the tendency. Maybe, Lev, important to say yeah. that to avoid bias, the panelists and the host cannot vote. It's the vote from the audience only. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Okay, thank you very much. I think the the the, uh, the tendencies I don't think will be changed over time, but really appreciate your contribution. So it's absolutely clear that I think there are two leading causes of why uh, all of us are interested in this topic and why it's so relevant from the policy management and other perspectives. And I think why we are again very pleased to to launch this uh, study on the World Soil Day. So definitely soil health and impacts of plastics on soil biodiversity and also um, issues related to the impact of um, agricultural plastics on public health are the leading causes and um, for obvious reasons but this is again the uh, this is also the reasons that um, 
compromised soil health, which is an integrated uh, characteristic, if you wish, um, I think will ultimately have negative impacts on, um, on all our activities which are associated with soil use. Uh, so the cascading effects on uh, crop yield and uh, production and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Uh, I think again, without now long ado, um, I am very pleased to uh, welcome Richard Thompson, as I mentioned, one of the lead authors uh, of FAO report to um, present major findings. Report assessment of agricultural plastics and their sustainability, a call for action. Thank you, Lev. Uh, let me share my screen. Good evening. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, this is FAO's first global assessment of plastics used in agriculture. I, as, as Lev said, I'm one of the authors, along with Jane Gilbert, who will join us for the panel discussion later, and Marco Ricci. The report presents the results of a study Excuse me. Uh, uh, investing agricultural plastic products used globally in a range of different value chains, crop production, livestock, aquaculture and fisheries and forestry. It assesses the types and quantities of plastic products and their benefits and trade-offs. It's based on data derived from peer-reviewed scientific papers, governmental and non-governmental organizations reports, as well as from industry experts. Its recommendations were verified during extensive consultation with FAO and external experts, many of whom are participating in this webinar. We thank you all for your valuable contributions. We hope it will provide an impetus for discussion about agricultural plastics, their benefits and trade-offs, and ultimately stimulate action to reduce their potential for harm and improve their circularity. So what does it say? So these are the numbers you've, you've heard from Lev and uh, Eduardo. So we estimate that every year, 12.5 million tons of plastic products are used in crop production, livestock production, forestry, and fisheries. That's equivalent to 3.5% of the global plastic production. Add to this, close to 37 million tons are used in food packaging. We couldn't find reliable data to estimate plastics used in storage, processing, and distribution. So the primary focus of the report is therefore on plastics used in agricultural production. The crop production and livestock sectors are the largest users accounting for just over 10 million tons per year. Incidentally, this is almost the same as the annual quantity of plastic marine litter originating from land-based sources, some 11 million tons. Followed by fisheries and aquaculture at 2.1 million tons and forestry at 0.2 million tons. Now, these are, these are also indicative of the annual quantities that become waste or leak to the environment. So what are agricultural plastics? What are we talking about? Well, here are some examples. We have polymer coated controlled release fertilizers, fertilizer sacks, fertilizer big bags, seedling plug trays, mulching film, which I'm sure you'll hear a lot about throughout today, Greenhouse films, shade and protective nets, drip irrigation, irrigation pipes, plant supports and ties, pesticide containers, reusable harvesting crates, hermetically sealable sacks for harvest storage, bailed nets and twines, silage tubes, film wrap for silage bales, covers for bunkers, livestock ear tags, tree guards, tree labels and ties, fishing nets, boat gear, and shellfish traps. And here we have reusable uh, repurposed drums for icing fish and insulated boxes for keeping fish. The quality and availability of data on the types of products used in 
each region are highly variable. This graph shows our estimates of their global usage in 2018. Films are the largest category used in greenhouse mulching and silage. Industry has projected that their use will increase by 50% within the decade. Benefits and trade-offs, why are they used? Multi you heard mulching films and drip irrigation have increased crop yields, they've reduced water demand, they've suppressed weed and mold growth on fruit, reducing the use of agrochemicals. Coated fertilizers provide constant delivery of nutrients to the root zone, improving efficiency of uptake, avoiding emissions to atmosphere and runoff to surface waters. Greenhouses and tunnels extend growing seasons, improve yields and quality, and give farmers access to new markets. Bagging bananas protects the fruit from weather and insect damage, and hermetically sealed sacks reduce food loss during storage. And plastic is ubiquitous in fishing gear through its durability, lightness, and effectiveness of catching fish. So what are the trade-offs? The trade-offs in the fishery sector have been well documented, for example, with ghost gear continuing to kill fish. An ever-growing body of evidence shows that poor design, selection, usage, and end-of-life management leads to adverse impacts of terrestrial and marine ecosystems. Often users don't have the capacity for selection, application, management, and retrieval of plastics. Most farmers and fishers lack access to sound environmental end-of-life management resulting in plastic waste often left contaminating soils, coasts, and the sea, or being dumped and burnt. Only a small fraction is recycled. The introduction of biodegradable plastic films brings additional complexity and challenge because of the variability in degradation, depending on local conditions. Evidence from China has showed that accumulation of plastics above 240 kilograms per hectare in surface soils can decrease crop yields by 25%. Our simulation with best practical retrieve rates between 90 and 98% showed that the continuous use of mulching, this level of contamination could be reached between 14 and 70 years. Plastic production also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions and thus contributes to climate change. This diagram shows the potential pathways for degraded agricultural practice plastics to other media and their impacts. Microplastics contamination in soil come from degradation during use of agricultural plastics and their inappropriate disposal on farms and the use of soil amendments containing microplastics such as bio, biosolids as Leticia mentioned. Agricultural soils are thought to receive greater quantities of microplastics than oceans. Furthermore, they absorb and concentrate persistent organic pollutants, and as such, likely present as yet unquantified risk to human health. Microplastics from terrestrial agriculture have been shown to migrate to aquatic ecosystems. This is now a major topic of research with an explosion of publications, especially related to contamination of food. There is evidence that nanoplastics may cross cell membranes where there is potential to accumulate and impair cellular physiology and evoke inflammatory responses. Macro and microplastics are thought to present specific risks to animal health through ingestion and biomagnification as shown in some studies. So um, we selected uh, products uh, for evaluation. We did this by means of a, um, an assessment tool. Uh, it used source, the extent and frequency of their use, pathway, the likelihood of plastics entering the environment through damage, degradation, littering, receptor, the extent of its contact with terrestrial and aquatic environments, and consequence, its potential to harm plants, animals, and humans. Uh, this produced this ranking of uh, the priority products, and those from the top were polymer coated fertilizers, mulching films, pesticide containers, silage films and nets, expanded polystyrene fish boxes, irrigation tape, fishing gear and aquaculture cages, and pesticide impregnated bags for banana fruit protection. These were further investigated and potential alternatives identified. As the report is about plastic products, we did not assess the 
biosolid soil amendments that are contaminated with microplastics. These have been addressed in the Global Assessment of Soil Pollution, published earlier this year, and in UNEP's working paper. The study reviewed these priority products in detail, identifying their benefits and trade-offs and the issues that they caused. Strong scientific evidence shows that plastic products in agriculture can be both beneficial and also detrimental to food security and food safety. However, there is no silver bullet, silver bullet solution to this complex material problem. Many of them lie in system, systemic application of the six R's approach, which you can see in this diagram. Refuse, redesign, reduce, reuse, recycle and recover. The principles of circularity. But options should be assessed for each particular application and in specific local contexts using life cycle approaches. Some examples of the potential alternatives that we identified include alternative products and practices that avoid plastics use altogether. For example, cover crops and biomass to replace uh, mulching films. Reusable and durable products such as glass and durable plastic covers for greenhouses allow to reduce plastic use. Biodegradable polymers are promising materials for plant support, mulching films. Mandatory extended producer responsibility for the collection and recycling of all non-biodegradable plastics and incentive mechanisms to encourage sustainable practices. In summary, the initial analysis of the management responses suggests that there's no single international government framework that addresses plastics used in agriculture holistically and allows to balance its environmental and social economic benefits and trade-offs. So uh, as we've heard from Letitia, there are plans for a new international agreement to be uh, discussed at UNEA next year. This is encouraging news. However, the extent to which agricultural plastics will be addressed and the speed of its negotiation are not certain. Soft law instruments such as in International voluntary guidelines have proven very effective in assisting countries to adopt national legislation covering specific ag agricultural activities. Good examples are the Code of Conduct on Responsible Fisheries and International Code of Conduct on Pesticide Management. Because they don't impose obligations on signatory, soft law instruments such as voluntary guidelines can be established more rapidly, can have a wider scope than international binding agreements. They can also cover obligations of key stakeholder groups, whereas international agreements are limited to obligations of national governments. It's the author's recommendation to adopt a two-pronged approach. While negotiations on binding international agreements proceed, a new holistic voluntary code of conduct, specifically on agricultural plastics, could be established. We think this would be the most effective way to support changes on the ground. This has been proposed for consideration at FAO's Committee for Agriculture next July. We also recommend main mainstreaming the issues of agricultural plastics throughout all FAO's instruments and guidance related to good agricultural practice, food security, food safety, and nutrition. The new codes could set roles and responsibilities for all stakeholders, including governments, regional body bodies, private sectors, sector and users. It could address a number of important aspects, including life cycle thinking and policy making, regional collaboration approaches for harmonization of practices and products, product and process standards, target setting, licensing and registration of products and processes, and finally man mandatory extended producer responsibility. It could provide a basis for governments to adopt legal policy and management frameworks to address agricultural plastics holistically within the context of food security, nutrition, food safety, and sustainable agriculture. The study identified a number of knowledge gaps and areas for further research, the most important of which are the, the global flows and fates of agricultural plastics, life cycle assessments for fossil-based and bio-based agricultural plastics and their alternatives, pathways and impacts for micro, macro, nanoplastics in, on agroecosystems, food safety and human health, and the behavior and rate of degradation of biodegradable products. And lastly, the impacts of agricultural plastic pollution on microbiomes, soil, water quality, and long-term soil productivity. 
while there are gaps in data, we shouldn't, we shouldn't use these as an excuse not to act. So I'd like to share with you uh, a quote from Deputy General Maria, Maria Helena Semedo in her foreword. This report serves as a loud call to coordinated and decisive action to facilitate good management practice and conserve, curb the disastrous use of plastics across the agricultural sectors. Thank you. Richard, thank you uh, very much for this uh, very comprehensive, excellent presentation. And I would like to acknowledge uh, your contribution, but also contribution of two other lead authors of the report, um, Jane Gilbert, who will take part in the, in the panel later today, but also Marco Ricci. It's been extensive research, um, but also the extensive consultations with various stakeholders uh, which led to the production of this um, uh, first assessment, uh, first global assessment of agricultural plastics. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to uh, give the floor to Christina uh, Tigerson, uh, who is the senior expert on waste and marine litter program in Grid Arendal. And Christina will present a working paper of plastics and agriculture, sources and impacts. The floor is yours, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lev. So I think my presentation is almost there. Um, I can put it into presentation mode. Thank you. So Lev already introduced myself. Um, I'm an expert. I, I work for Gridandal and I'm going to present a joint paper between Gridandal and UNEP. I have co-authors and contributors. Most of them are here. Um, it's Mahesh, it is Carla, you will hear later in the panel, and my dear colleague in Sydney, Professor Lynn Baker. So please start with the next slide. Can you go to the next slide, please? So here's the front page, the cover page. We call it Working Paper, Plastic and Agriculture, Sources and Impact. It's the first in a series of working paper, and the idea is to increase knowledge. We want to invite to discussion and action among the relevant stakeholders. And we also, with the joint purpose of reducing plastic and contamination of soil. So please, next one. I had limited time, so I'm gonna to try to show three important points about plastic and soil, and also points that we can look at on future working, future working papers. Next one, please. The first thing we know is that plastic accumulates in soil. And it has been mapped around the world, but unfortunately not so extensively. So we see in the top corner here, we see the world. We have some in North and South America, the Middle East and Australia, some in Europe, you see on the left and the right side, and also a lot in South China and China. The problem with these ones is we don't always match and map the same way. So it's very important that we actually dig into this and find the standard way to, to map our microplastic in the soil so we can have a baseline and we can see if future initiatives are gonna change things. So next one, please. The second point is this plastic impact soil. We know that, and it's both in the structure and in the biology. The picture here was very fascinating. I think it's a soil aggregate that interacts with, with microplastic fibers and what happens is that this concentrate uh, in the soil, it can influence the carbon and the nitrogen cycle, and it can also affect microbial and fungal abundance. So it is something that we should look into. And the next point I would raise with the next slide is the fact that plastic can be exported to other ecosystems. On the top, we see the sources that Richard already mentioned in this in his presentation. Below, we see the way that uh, microplastic can move through, through the system, through the um, ecosystems. One of them all the way to the right is through, through biota. Biota can pull plastic particles down into the soil. We have runoff events in heavy rainfalls when, when the soil is not covered. And we also have wind transport. This is just some of them. There are, of course, more. Next slide, please. 
So let's look at two sources of plastic in soil. Of course, there are more than two, but let's look at these ones. Next slide, please. We have the Maltz film that are for multiple purposes. Here, it's in Norway. It's early potatoes. It's very cold in April. It can be. We cover the soil and the potatoes which, and heat the soil, which um, help the plants to grow. Next one, please. The second one I want to highlight is the sewage sludge and the biosolids. It's fantastic for nutrients and we cannot let this chance miss. We can't miss out on the chance of using these nutrients. And we see here around the world that it is being used very much in different countries, basically in the US and Europe and Australia, are the major uses of biosolids and sewage sludge in agriculture. Now, if we go to the next slide, there's always a bot to import to good stuff. And that is that we get all of these microplastics and fibers from the clothes we wash, from other things that happens before um, the sewage, the wastewater and the sewage lodge are treated. So we need to find a way to get rid of these microplastics. And that is, that is a challenge that we have to take off. So next slide, please. So what to do with these? Well, we talked about reuse and recycle, and it often ends up in downcycling. And the problem is the contamination. Here are some numbers from, from Europe where they found out that mulching often increased its weight by 200% from being used. And the next one you see is 100% of the small tunnels. So you can see that the ones that are closest to the ground and to the plants are the ones that are mostly contaminated and they are so difficult to recycle in a good way. So if we change slide. They are the biodegradable mulch plastic as well. And, and we look at them and we see maybe is that a good alternative? But so far we do have still to ask question if when we use the label biodegradable, is it really biodegradable? And is it biodegradable sufficiently enough to actually avoid accumulation of plastic in the soil when used every year? We also have to consider the fact that we grow, we grow food all the way from the south of Australia to North Norway. And the soil temperature and the soil types are very different. And how does that work together with these, my, with these biodegradable plastics? So before we decide that this is a good idea, it's very important to understand the long-term impacts of these biodegradables. So let's go to the next slide. So there's also the nature-based and nature-positive-based solution where we try to use try to do our food production without depleting nor destroying the natural resources. So the first question that comes into mind for me is like, so what plastic products can be replaced by these nature-based solutions? And what are short-term and long-term benefits, both for the soil, but also for the economy? And how can we upscale these good solutions that are for sure out there? So let's go to the last slide. And I think I'm within my five minutes. If I should pull out three recommendation of this report, of course, there are much more recommendation than this, it would be to develop a standardized method of detecting microplastic in soil for better understand the residence time and the transformation. It would be to develop the mechanism to removing microplastic particles and fibers from the sludge and the biosolid because we need that nutrient for, for fertilizer. And it would also be to accelerate research and development of cost-effective plastic alternatives, including nature-based solutions. So this is the report in highlights. I encourage you to look at the report. It's, it's not that long, but it do give a lot of information about the current standard and, and place of the research that's available. So that is all for me. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Christina, thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's it's so uh, I mean complementing these uh, two presentations uh, that you really allowed us to uh, to get a more deeper look 
on um, uh, plastic pollution and so on. So thank you very much. I would like to remind our participants just for the uh, operational uh, efficiency. If um, you could post your questions uh, to panelists and to presenters you've heard so far in the Q&A part uh, of um, our webinar, and if you would like to share some information about the reports uh, about your organization, please use chat for this, which we will um, analyze. And I want to say that uh, also this webinar is being recorded, and I think it will be available on, on, online for those um, of our colleagues who didn't have a chance to attend. Christina, thank you so much again. And I think uh, now we are moving to, um, to our panel, um, which will be moderated by um, Mahesh Pradhan. Mahesh is, uh, UNAP, uh, Mahesh is working at the United Nations Environment Programme and coordinating global partnership on nutrient management. Um, as well, he is an interim co coordinator for one of the regional seas programs, uh, which is called Coordinating Body for the East Asian Seas, COPSI. So there's many responsibilities. Uh, Mahesh, the floor is yours. Um, and uh, I think I, I mute myself now. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Lev. And I think it was a real tremendous start with the opening statements from Eduardo, Leticia, and these two presentations from Richard on the FAO report and Christina on the UNEP working paper. Um, this issue is huge. And I think given the interest, we have nearly 400 people still on the line. Uh, it shows the interest. But now in terms of the panel, and may I request the panelists to please turn on their cameras, is that we have a very exciting panel ahead of us. Um, we have a land and water officer, we have a farmer, head of the National Farmers Platform, we have a marine litter expert, we have a fishery officer, and then we have a waste management professional. So I think it's quite diverse, and I think given the wealth of knowledge and experience, we are in for some very good discussions. So let me quickly introduce our five panelists. First is Natalia Rodriguez Eugenio. Maybe you can wave, Natalia. Great. So she's based in Rome from Spain and a land and water officer at FAO. And she's a member of the Global Soil Partnership Secretariat. Uh, she's a biologist and soil scientist uh, by training and with 13 years of experience on sustainable soil management. Uh, the last of which, last five years of which was on soil pollution in Europe and worldwide. Second is Sherifo. Sherifo is coming to us from the Gambia. Uh, he's the president of the National Farmers Platform in the Gambia. And he also served uh, as Minister of Agriculture earlier. Uh, next, we have my colleague Carla uh, uh, from UNEP, from the Pollution Fee Ecosystems Unit in the Eco uh, Ecosystems Division. Uh, she worked at UNEP's uh, North America office in Washington, DC, where she coordinated the work on ecosystems, as well as on chemicals and waste since 2012. Uh, her background academic is on conservation biology on, and sustainable development, as well as health. Next, we have Esther, um, who is a fishery officer working for FAO in Rome, Italy. Uh, she has worked in the provision of scientific uh, advice to support the establishment of international standards such as those set by the Codex Alimentarius for the safety and quality of uh, fisheries and aquacultural products over the past 10 years. Uh, during this time, she also worked uh, to provide technical support and cooperation um, on projects to upgrade food safety situation of the fisheries and aquaculture sector in many areas of the world. Um, she also has very interesting private sector and the food industry experience. And last but not the least, all the way from Mongolia at the moment uh, is our colleague Jane, one of the authors of the FAO report. 
Uh, Jane is a waste management professional who has been involved in the organics recycling sector for over 20 years. Uh, her expertise is on composting and on anaerobic digestion sectors. And she has extensive experience working with industry, trade associations, professional bodies, and, and government. So with this and um, the five panelists, as well as Richard and Christina, I think we are on target to have a very lively discussion. As Lev reminded you, for the questions, please make sure you put them on the Q&A box. Yeah? That way, we, the panelists, we get to see the questions. So let me start with Natalia. And since we are just having this uh, in conjunction with the World Soil Day, um, in terms of asking you the first question about this earlier report, the Global Assessment of Soil Pollution, uh, which was released earlier this year, what were the main findings of this report and what is the contribution of plastics to soil pollution? Over to you, Natalia. Thank you so much, Mahesh. Indeed, a uh, very interesting uh, question. Well, the main findings of this collaborative report that was produced by more than uh, 200 uh, scientists and practitioners, and it was uh, published jointly by the FAO Global Soil Partnership and UNEP, can be summarized in six main points. Uh, first, soil pollution poses a major threat to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is particularly relevant to the poverty, food, and health nexus, as soil pollution reduces crop yields, safety and quality uh, of food products, and leads to reduced incomes for rural populations, hitting the most vulnerable the hardest. Second, there are still significant gaps in knowledge and uncertainty about the extent of the affected areas and the magnitude of the impact, which is compounded with the emergence of new contaminants. There are also important knowledge gaps regarding interactions between the multiple contaminants found in soils and their combined effects on organisms. Along with climate change, environmental pollution, and especially soil pollution, is one of the main global challenges facing humanity today. And it is a transboundary problem that requires joint coordinated global actions. In addition, soil pollution is one of the major threats to world soils and jeopardizes the provision of key ecosystem services. Soil can become a source of contaminants for other environmental compartments, including food, water, air, terrestrial and aquatic organisms, and also humans. Ecosystem health and human health are therefore interconnected. Soil, which is the basis of terrestrial life and the provider of most of our food and water, <coughs> should be at the center of the One Health approach as this cannot be effectively addressed without tackling soil pollution first. Um, soil and environmental pollution is also on the rise, according to the information we gather for this report. And unless there is a shift, uh, a rapid shift in production and consumption patterns and a political commitment to truly, sustain, to truly sustainable management of natural resources, we will not revert this trend. And finally, effective regulations, including the polluter pay, pays principle, are still lacking in many countries. Uh, we analyzed all the legal frameworks from the uh, countries worldwide, and we found out that action is frequently taken after an environmental or health problem occurs, instead of preventing such damage. And this is happening in developed and developing countries. And regarding your second question on the share of plastics in soil pollution, uh, actually, we don't know how much soil pollution is due to agroplastics alone, and probably we will never do because plastics and also plasticizers are not a unique problem in themselves, but because all the other contaminants associated with plastics, such as heavy metal, persistent organic contaminants like PCBs or pesticides, or even pathogens. The fate of plastics in soil is very complex, as Christina just shared uh, in her presentation, and are very localized. 
Uh, many of the participants that the, we have here with us today in this event are working hard in research to bring some light to the complex processes that govern plastic fate in soils. In my opinion, we may know how many plastics are produced and traded, but getting concrete data on how many plastics end up in the soil is an Herculean task. Agroplastics uh, can be partially broken down by mechanical action like agricultural machinery, waste collection and treatment plants, or by weathering, <clears throat> including sunlight, resulting in a, a wide variety of plastics of different sizes in ecosystem. The detection science for these tiny particles in the soil matrix is still in its infancy, so the quantity could be much higher than the existing estimates that we have in our reports. And also due to their small size, microplastics and nanoplastics can be ingested by organisms and penetrate cellular system, causing damage and possibly mortality, as has been seen in a small salt dwelling organism. And are transferred or could be transferred through the food chain. Uh, we need to consider that microplastics have been found in the human placenta and probably all living organisms have considerable amounts of micro and nanoplastics in our bodies. Although the long-term effects uh, or long-term health effects have yet to be fully elucidated. And despite the knowledge gaps we have identified, I want to make clear, uh, send you a, a very clear message that we already have more than enough evidence to know that soil pollution and um, uh, plastic pollution is a real problem putting human and ecosystem health at, and the achievement of the whole 2030 sustainable development agenda at risk. So we must take our urgent action to deal with it and prevent soil pollution. This is all from my side. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Natalia. Uh, let's move on to Sherifo. And given that uh, we had the whole soil day just on the 5th of December, with the theme of soil salinization. Um, and this is an increasing problem in the Gambia. Um, Sherifo, how are farmers using agricultural plastics to adapt and what issues are they facing? Over to you. Uh, Sheriff, I think you're still mute. Uh, you probably have to unmute, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, as you have rightly mentioned, soil sterilization in the Gambia is a problem. Uh, soil sterilization negatively impacts plan development and induces land degradation in the Gambia. Now, as this is a case, it leads to low agricultural productivity, worsens the farmer's well-being. That means if the production is not optimal, the farmers normally suffer from that. The overall economy of the farmer reduces and it will force the farmers to abandon rice growing ecologies and move to other ecologies. Now, this excess accumulation of water soluble soils in the land, these farmers will resort to doing, resort to drip irrigation, that is providing boreholes or providing pumping machines that will be enabled to collect water and it is dripped into their rice fields for productivity. And uh, there is a total irrigation also. Ecologists that are on the banks of the river Gambia eventually will have to use tidal irrigation in order to get their farms being irrigated. Uh, they also resort to building dikes. These dikes are preventing soil intrusion into the ecologies. They harvest water also, water harvested by using polythenes, like they put big ditches covered with polythenes, collect rainwater, and these waters are used for irrigation. Now, and also the resort to introduction of soil tolerant crops so that 
they can adapt themselves to the situation on the ground. Actually, these are the things that farmers do, and this is the remedy that they are doing towards salinization in the Gambia. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, for excellent to have that view from the farmer perspective mm -hmm. and what they're doing. Um, Sherifo, are you done? Can I continue? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, let's move on now to this issue. I, I see in the question and answer and, and chat that it's mentioned quite a bit um, about this issue on uh, non-biodegradable plastics, extended producer responsibility, et cetera. And, and I think my colleague Carla is perfect in the sense that Carla, the FAO report recommends that in cases where the use of non-biodegradable plastics is to continue, mm -hmm. uh, countries should establish mandatory EPR, extended producer responsibility schemes. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain how such EPR schemes work and what are the key factors for their success? Over to you, Carla. Great, thank you, Mahesh. And uh, as many participants uh, today surely know, but others perhaps are less familiar, EPR is a policy approach in which a manufacturer's responsibility for a product is extended to the post-consumer stage of its life cycle. So it is a way to bring producers to the table as really key actors in the development of solutions, in this case, to the plastic pollution issue. Um, the cost of collection, sorting, and treatment of plastic waste tends to be much higher than, than what can be gained through the recycling market, which is why most of these waste management systems, where they exist, uh, are heavily subsidized by governments. Uh, making producers responsible for the end-of-life management internalizes this cost and can reduce the financial bar barriers um, uh, for improving post-consumer management of these products especially in developing countries. And they can also foster reuse and recycle, recycling markets that are otherwise may not be economically viable. EPR can also promote innovation and the development of new business models. It can incentivize, among other things, better design of products to make them easier to recycle, for example. Um, or they can foster alternative systems, including reuse schemes, that can deliver the products and services that we need without relying on single use plastics. And this in turn promotes circularity by making it easier for this product to stay in the economy rather than becoming waste and as happens too often, end up as pollution in the environment. And it also reduces the need for virgin plastics. Um, there are many ways in which manufacturers can ensure the adequate post-consumer management of their products and they can, for example, develop schemes that take back their products at the end of their useful life, or they can pay a third party to undertake the end of life management of the products. So they can enable another company or nonprofit organization to handle the post-consumer management. Um, and where governments provide or a parts or all of this service, uh, producers can also reimburse the governments for their portion of the waste management, which can provide a much needed injection of funds to improve uh, coverage and sustainability of these systems that are often very cash strapped. Um, there are hundreds of EPR schemes already in operation around the world, applied to many types of products from electronics to mattresses to packaging of various materials. At least 41, uh, EPR schemes exist for agricultural plastics um, a, 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 a deal with pesticide containers. And this is actually a very good thing, given that the, uh, given the high and well-known health concerns regarding these products and their packaging. A very well-known example of a successful program is the legally mandated Campo Limpo, uh, which is uh, highlighted in the FAO report. Um, it's a scheme for collecting pesticide containers in Brazil. It manages 46 million tons of plastics annually uh, and has a 94% collection and recycling rate, uh, both rates. Um, the highest uh, really of all uh, pesticide containers entering the Brazilian market. Uh, many other schemes started with pesticide containers and expanded to other products, which actually helps them to achieve economies of scale. A good example, in, in this case, a voluntary scheme, 
is the ADI Valor Scheme in France, which collects and recycles a very wide variety of agricultural plastics, including uh, pesticide containers, mulch, and other types of films, bags, twines, nets, irrigation tubes, among many others. It has been in place for almost 20 years, and they recycle most of the plastic products that they collect. Um, mulch films are uh, more difficult, uh, you know, based on what uh, um, uh, Christina mentioned earlier, and we can talk about later. So what are some elements of success? I mean, they can vary depending on many factors. EPR schemes are not necessarily a one-size-fits-all thing. They should be tailored to the local, national, and regional context to ensure their feasibility. Um, although there are examples of great voluntary schemes, like the one I mentioned in France, mandatory EPR schemes tend to be more successful. Uh, this ensures a level playing field where every producer shares a fair portion of the cost and avoids the problem of free riders. However, it needs to be set up in a way that doesn't disproportionately affect small and medium sized enterprises. And also in a way that ensures uh, that even small scale farmers can have access to the scheme. Uh, also having a mandated uh, instead of a voluntary scheme helps to ensure that a critical mass is reached so that these efforts can be done at scale. They need to include transparent monitoring and reporting to assess its success and when necessary to correct course. They should uh, take a wide range of agricultural waste and uh, have access to reuse or recycling infrastructure with sufficient capacity. Uh, they need to bring together all the key stakeholders in the supply chain with, with clear roles and responsibilities. And this is from producers to importers, distributors and retailers to users. And finally, to those who manage the end of life stages, including informal collection and recycling workers. Um, and good communication campaigns and training to farmers are also very much needed to incentivize their participation. And the system should make it as easy and inexpensive as possible for farmers to be able to comply. So I'll leave it at this since I know I've taken my five minutes and we can continue to discuss. Great. Uh, thank you, Carla. Uh, let's move on to Esther now um, and, and this issue of food safety in terms of microplastics being present in large quantities in agricultural soils, as we've just heard from Richard and Christina. Um, the, their accumulation in the food chain and the presence of pl plastic additives presents a major environmental challenge. So in terms of Esther, what are your thoughts uh, for the implications for food safety? Over to you, Esther. Thank you. Thank you, Manish, for the uh, question. So I would start by putting things into context and clarify that there are different routes of exposure to microplastics. And the human body is exposed to microplastics through ingestion of food containing microplastics, through inhalation of microplastics in the air, and by dermal contact of these particles that are contained in products, in textiles, and in the, or in the dust. And the available information that we have suggests that inhalation is the major source, source of microplastics uh, exposure. Having said that, it's important to highlight that while we start to understand our exposure to microplastics and plastic additives via ingestion through the various food commodities, we have limitations to define what this implies for human health. Because this will depend on microplastics composition, microplastic size and microplastic shape, which will allow or not translocation across the guts and um, also um, culinary practices and food processing techniques, such as the application of heat treatments and pressure. In addition, we know that microplastics are porous materials and can absorb contaminants from the environment, which could be dissolved, uh, dissolved. So let us say release at a later stage during cooking or in the human body. And lastly, we know that microplastics are suitable substrates to be colonized by, by microorganisms. So mostly due to their hydrophobicity that promotes biofilm formation. So they can also be a source of pathogenic microorganisms because of this reason. Microplastics have been found in a variety of food commodities. 
Uh, there are studies on salt, sugar, honey, beer, water, apples, pears, broccoli, lettuce, and carrots, and as well as um, uh, fisheries and aquaculture products, which seem to be the best study source of microplastics exposure via diets. But there have been previous exercises carried out by FAO on food safety for fisheries and aquaculture products. And well, we know that those aquatic products consume whole contribute more to the exposure of microplastics, which tend to accumulate in the gastrointestinal tract of animals. Although the exposure assessment could only be carried out for additives and microplastic additives and contaminants, not for polymers because of their unknown toxicity. But the preliminary assessments suggested that the contribution of hazardous chemicals associated with microplastics in variables, for example, that are consumed whole, is very small compared to other sources. And something very similar happened with an exercise carried out by WHO on microplastics in drinking water. And the study concluded that chemicals associated with microplastics in drinking water were of low concern. And regarding agri-food products, there is very limited information, but some preliminary studies suggest that the exposure to microplastics is even lower from the intake of agri-food products compared to, for example, mineral water in plastic bottles that didn't seem to be a concern. However, to get to further conclusions, analytical methods for the detection and quantification of micro and nanoplastics in food, human tissues, and blood should be standardized. This is very important to compare data. And after this, more reliable occurrence data could be generated, which could be used for exposure assessment of dietary intake. So this is to know a bit more about the impact on food safety. Also, toxicological data on micro and nanoplastics uh, need to be generated. Um, where the most common polymers and, and uh, plastic additives must be considered, and further data on translocation acro across the guts of micro and nanoplastics composed of the most common polymers should be developed for food animals and humans. So let's say that we know now much more than when that what we knew back in 2016 when we started working on microplastics in FAO mostly on uh, microplastics in the aquatic in the aquatic environment back then but there are still many research gaps that need to be filled in the coming years to better understand food safety implications of microplastics coming from traditional plastic materials and also from their alternatives Thanks, and over to you, Maesh. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, let's move on to our last speaker, and from a solutions perspective, uh, Jane. Um, in terms of the, could all issues of agricultural plastics be solved by replacing all conventional polymers with biodegradable alternatives? Your thoughts? Okay, thank you, Mahesh, and um, good evening, everybody, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, it, it, it's a tempting um, solution, isn't it? You know, we, it would be nice if we had a silver bullet and one where we could just replace it, one problem with a solution. But, um, it, it, you know, as, as you've seen in the report, as you will see in the report, the use of agricultural plastics and the applications to which they are put are complex. And we need to consider very carefully the types of products and the types of applications to which they're going to be used. Now, as we've highlighted in the report, there will clearly be some applications where biodegradable and compostable polymers will have a use. And we, we've some in the chat section, in the question and answer session that's been, that's been um, pinging up on our screens, We've, we've rightly had some pertinent points about the use of terminology. So we need to be very, very clear about the use of terminology and about the types of polymers that are being used. There's clearly, as we've highlighted in the report, some 
low-hanging fruit, if that's not an inappropriate pun in this uh, context, um, that it's some very quick wins and the use of um, agricultural mulch films that are difficult to remove once they're down in the soil, they tend to tear, they become entrained with topsoil and they will become entrained with, entrapped with um, plants that have grown through them. Um, Soil-based solutions might well be the best, but as we've also highlighted in the report as well, one of the important things is to ensure that the products function specifically for the applications to which they are intended. So, for example, with, with mulch films, we need to make sure that mulch films sold in, for example, Northern Europe, would not necessarily be appropriate for soil films, um, mulch films sold and used in Southern Europe. So we need to look more closely at the specifications that these products can meet. I think it's important, and we are um, a while ago, um, earlier on in the um, session, we did have um, somebody put either in the chat function on the question and answer the important point about independent certification. And there are a number of standards, internationally validated, recognised standards, such as um, EN 17033 for mulch films, and there are compostability standards. And having products that are specifically certified to these is going to be a really important point but where we do need some additional information and tailoring the products to the specific applications i think there is need for parties to come together to work on developing end use specific specifications that oh that overlayer the um the, the independent certification to the standard. So the certification to an independent recognised standard will be important. And when I say certification, this needs to be independently verified. But then there are end use specifications tailored to very specific soil type conditions, um, climatic conditions and so forth. And I think that's a big piece of work but one that could be very, very useful in moving forward for a certain type of product. So, for example, mulch films, twines and, and um, clips that um, attach plants to, um, to, to, um, to, to props and um, stakes and also to, for um, tree sapling um, protectors as well. So I think there's, there's quite a bit of work that could be done and, you know, it would be interesting to see um, and perhaps, you know, if, if FAO could take the lead on working with industry and um, agriculture sector to look at developing some of these over and above the, um, the independent um, certification. So, so I think the answer to that is yes, there are for some products, but clearly um, biodegradable, compostable um, products are not going to be suitable for everything. We don't want pond liners that are going to biodegrade in six, 12 months, clearly, or irrigation pipes. Um, so it's, uh, it's a case of picking the right products for the right types of solutions, bearing in mind the 6R approach that we've developed and the risk assessment work that we, we carried out as part of this project. Excellent. So I hope that answers yeah. that question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Jane, for that. Um, I hate to cut such an interesting sort of conversation short, uh, but I'm mindful of the time. Uh, so what I was thinking is uh, there are many questions and, and to participants, we will attempt, if we cannot answer them, uh, email you back and we will ask our panelists to pick up on whatever they feel they can sort of uh, respond to. So you could expect some emails back on the queries if we do not cover. But what I wanted to end off is on a sort of lightning flash round to all the panelists. If from the questions and comments that they've seen in the chat and the Q&A, that they have a one minute sort of closing statement that they would like to sort of say. So maybe I will start with Richard and then move on through the sequence of speakers. Richard, one minute, over to you. 
Okay, but I was going to just answer one question, uh, which was that the largest use of field plastics in our area of California is drip irrigation tape accounting for about 60% of field plastics use. Does anyone have any ideas for the six R's and whether there are redesigns options for these R's? Um, yes, if you read the report, this is one of the aspects that we covered. Uh, the recommendation is that a drip irrigation tube currently is often made from a number of different polymers. Uh, these should be redesigned so it's all made from the same polymer to increase its value for recycling. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. Christina, maybe any question or comment over to you? Yes, there have been a lot about biodegradable plastics, and, and I do agree with Jane on her points as well on the biodegradable. And I know that there are huge amount of studies um, on looking at how biodegradable plastic actually is in different types of soil and climates. And I think that's a really important thing to, to continue looking at before we upscale that product. So that's my thought on that. Great, thanks, Christina. Natalia, over to you. Thank you very much, Mahesh. Well, I don't see any specific question to, to me, but indeed I can reply to some of the, of the questions that are addressed in general regarding if we are researching the impact of plastics uh, to soil health. Actually in FAO, and I don't think in UNEP they do, we do not do research. We just uh, collect, gather information done by the research community, and we make it available to policymakers, uh, land users, and the civil society. And indeed, uh, many of the participants of this uh, seminar have been posting very interesting uh, links on the chat regarding uh, research projects, focus specific, specifically on that, on the impact of micro and nanoplastics on soil health. Uh, for example, the Minagris project, the Papillons project, and I think they are already having, they started last or this year, but I think they are already having interesting results. So we will share with all of you those links and uh, also in the global assessment of soil pollution, you can find some interesting um, publications and summary of the research that exists already regarding that, regarding the impact not only on soil health, on soil organism, but also on human health. So I invite you to read uh, the Global Assessment of Soil Pollution Report. Thank you, Mahesh. Perfect. Uh, Sherry, over to you. Uh, maybe if from a policy sort of perspective in the Gambia, um, how are things changing in terms of agricultural plastics? Uh, you have to unmute, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as far as the Gambia is concerned, there is a policy in place as far as plastics are concerned. Actually, uh, from what I am seeing here, uh, there is a lot being done about how these plastics, research are done, how, how plastics are used in agriculture. Now in the Gambia, the Ministry of Agriculture, under the Department of Agriculture, there was a unit create, created. This unit is called the Soil and Water Management Unit. And this unit is responsible of managing the land use of the Gambia. And uh, they are doing a lot of work as far as land management is concerned. And they are actually trying to sensitize the farmers as to how they use their land. I am very much impressed with what I have already learned from this uh, panel discussion and the presentation done here. But what I'm trying to plea on is that let the researchers involve farmers. I don't know whether, I'm not saying they are not involved, but I am encouraging them to put them more and more on this research. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for that, Sherifo. Mm -hmm. Esther, over to you. Thank you much. I don't see any questions related to my uh, field of expertise, but I have a comment because I see that there is a lot of hope on uh, biodegradable plastics. And I would like to mention that, uh, well, it's it's important that when we develop alternative materials, we also take into consideration food safety aspects because in eventually these plastics or a part of them will end up in our food chain. So the use of uh, not only 
uh, polymers that are biodegradable is um, uh, important. Also, some of the additives and things that we add to those uh, plastics are really, really important when it comes to uh, food safety. So that's that's my my comment. Thank you, Mesh. Excellent. Uh, last but not the least, Jane, over to you. Yeah, I, I think that there are, as we've highlighted in the report, there are an awful lot of unknowns, but that really shouldn't stop us from acting. The, the, the imperative for us to act to reduce pollution of soils by agricultural plastics is massive. So I'm hoping that the framework we've developed within this report will give countries, will give nations, will give regions the tools by which they can assess the priorities and start to act sooner rather than later. And uh, I think hopefully this should be a, you know, the, the report should be um, a, a tool to enable people to effectively start to tackle agricultural plastics wherever yeah. they happen to live. Thanks, Jane, and, and my apologies to Carla. Uh, over to you, Carla. No problem. Well, there were a few questions on nature-based solutions, so just very quickly, I think it's important to note that in addition to the important you know, aspect of improving management of plastics used in agriculture, we should also consider nature-based solutions that can provide the benefits that we need. Um, for example, covered crops uh, that can control weeds and regulate soil temperature, uh, and help retain soil moisture can, you know, uh, uh, function as uh, the same thing as, for example, plastic mulch uh, uses. So, and they can also provide a habitat for uh, uh, beneficial for organisms, for example. So anyway, we need more in-depth economic analysis, I think, to better be able to compare the costs and benefits of agricultural plastics with those of nature-based solution. Um, taking the full range of ecosystem services into account and analyzing the full life cycle of each uh, product um, although the benefits of plastics may be higher in the short term, uh, if we take the full environmental co benefits into account, then maybe, you know, in some cases, nature based farming practices may be more cost effective in the long term. I'll keep it at that because uh, I know we're uh, past the uh, run out of time. Great, great. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone, all the panelists, for keeping to time, especially in this lightning round. But um, I think we've covered quite a bit in terms of the global assessment of soil pollution report. We looked at the theme of the World Soil Day, soil salinization and the farmer perspective in the Gambia. We talked about the extender producer responsibility schemes. Um, then we also highlighted this issue of food safety, very important. Um, and then in terms of solutions, um, biodegradable alternatives. Um, I think uh, lastly, uh, Carla talked about nature-based solutions, the cost benefit. I think there's so much work to be done. But if I go to the earlier poll and uh, the questions there in terms of health, soil health and human health were highlighted by all of you. And I think this is where we have to take the next steps in making this issue more mainstreamed. Uh, so with that, I would like to once again, thank all the panelists and speakers for the sharing their tremendous uh, amount of knowledge expertise, and that we will try to respond to some of the questions that we were not able to answer uh, via email, et cetera. Uh, Milka has also shared the link for the UNEP working paper. Uh, so you would also be able to access that. So with that, over to you, Lev, for the concluding session. I guess thank you very much and for excellent moderation to all the speakers, to panelists. It was not easy to include both a discussion about the evidence, but also the response and management solutions in, in one webinar. For sure, we have to continue. We are planning to organize also a high level event next year. So please stay tuned. Um, again, I don't want to I don't want to summarize a very rich discussion, um, but let me say one thing that uh, we have 10 years left to reach sustainable development goals. It's a very short time. And one of them is specifically related to uh, plastic uh, use in various sectors, including in agriculture. I think we need action at all grounds. We need partnerships, but I think above and beyond, we need a global movement. And I think agricultural plastics should um, play an important role 
and should uh, play uh, should have a particular place at the discussion table because this is an important issue. Uh, this is an issue. Uh, it's not only environmental issue, which is obvious, but it's an issue of uh, food security and nutrition. At the end of the day, we cannot address this without addressing the issue of um, agricultural plastics. Thank you so much uh, to, again, to all of you, to especially to all our participants um, for staying with us. I say it's almost still close to 300 participants uh, are with us. And um, let's continue uh, fighting. Uh, let's continue combating this issue together. And we're looking forward to um, uh, our next interactions on this topic. And with that, I'm, I'm pleased to, to close uh, and, and uh, uh, we will follow. Thank you. And have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm.